Welcome, everyone. Uh, we thought we'd do a talk today about some research we've done recently around open standards and what various opinions are out there. And so I'm Mike Dolan from the Linux Foundation. I work on a lot of our new project initiatives that we spin up. Um, I also work on our legal work. And I work very closely with Jory, who's our Vice President of Standards. And um, we are here to talk about open standards. What does that mean? Um, there's a lot of different opinions out there. Um, there's a lot of open source reports, state of open source, state of open, all kinds of reports out there about open source and what it means. Um, but when you get to open standards, not so much. There's a few things here and there over the past few decades, um, but it's uh, not consistent or it's just, uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of it. Um, we also see there's a number of definitions for open standards. Here I just copied and pasted in one from the Open Source Initiative, who has published an open standards definition. Um, some like it, some don't. Uh, similar to the open source definition, it's hard to fit on one slide. Um, some people take issue with certain aspects of it. Um, it can be a little bit challenging to think of which standards actually meet the definition. And uh, I'm not sure, I see some in the audience involved in OSI who might be able to tell me if this is working out uh, as planned, but um, I won't point fingers. Um, I like simple definitions. Uh, there's a simple one from IBM. Uh, my bias is to be transparent, I worked there for 10 years. We did a number of things in open source and open standards, um, but one of the things I did appreciate is that we had a pretty you know, concise view of it. And I share this as one other opinion that's out there. Um, it's certainly not definitive. But at the end of the day, if it's freely, adopt, freely available for adoption, implementation, and updates, I think that pretty much captures a lot of the essence of what people are looking for when they think of an open standard. But it's hard to tell. Do others agree with that or not? I'm not sure. When we look at open standards, we tend to see a lot of options, a lot of optionality, different ways of approaching standardization. You have different intentions. You have different levels of access or requirements around access. You have different intellectual property structures around how you develop a standard. And you have different participation uh, engagement models. We see closed standards, we see open standards. There's this continuum in the middle, and it's not very clear to us exactly what, what is you know, open standard versus not open standard. Um, I use closed standard here. Sometimes there's proprietary standards, you know, other terms for these things, but there is some sort of continuum. Um, you know, is it to just, and it's the intention just to support one company's ecosystem, which is a fine business goal. You can be a proprietary standard creator as a company, and people have to adopt your standard to plug into your ecosystem. That's a good business model for some companies. Some have made trillions of dollars off of that. Um, but there's other standards that have a different intention. The intention may be that everybody in the world uses a standard and connects through some layer like the internet. And there you need a much different type of standard. One company's standard isn't going to work for everybody. And so your intentionality may be different. The access levels. Who gets access to the standard? Both to contribute to the standard, to use the standard. Um, the intellectual property structure. Do you have to agree to one company's IP terms? Is there some sort of membership structure for a new entity that has a different intellectual property policy that all members agree to? Um, you know, is it something that is under RAND terms where there's probably going to be some sort of royalty payment requirement at some point? Or is it more of a RAND royalty-free model, which may require you to enter an agreement for a license, but it will at least be royalty-free? Um, there's also participation differences. Um, you may have a partner feedback program or something if it's a proprietary standard. You don't get an option to go change the standard or to provide feedback or changes to it. But there's other options. Most standards organizations today that we think of have member uh, requirements. Many don't. Many are open to anybody to participate. And we tend to associate many of those with the sort of open standards model. But we do see, I, I took one project that I'm aware of that we are working with a lot and mapped it out. What does it look like? And there's different options at different levels. It's not consistently one column or one way of doing things. Each standards organization has developed a model that works for them. 
Sometimes it's more open in certain aspects than others, but there may also be reasons for that. You may have you know, antagonists in the ecosystem that you don't want cooking in the kitchen with you as you're building a standard. There may be other things that require you to sort of protect what you're trying to do in the open with a moat and maybe some of these access or participation or even the IP terms are a way for you to create that moat to keep bad actors out. Um, and there's different outcomes of this. You know, there's some people you know, who consider anything that's not a proprietary closed standard that one company controls, everything is open standards beyond that. So the moment you allow any other companies to participate or anybody to participate, it's now an open standard at some level. And so, but there's different outcomes of that. You have the ORAN Alliance, for example, which in the telecommunications industry has been opening up, in their words, the RAN stack. And you may agree with what they're doing or not, but they essentially have a fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory IP model, which is not generally what the open source ecosystem really generally gravitates towards. Now, they've also set up an ORAN source code community, which is actually separate from the ORAN Alliance, and that one actually develops open source software and an Apache 2 license. But it's a different model. It's one where, in terms of what telecommunications for the RAN have been, this is more open than what they've been traditionally doing. At the same time, if you're gonna build a standard for containers that you expect every cloud provider in the world to adopt and to use and to propagate, you have to maybe do something a little bit differently. Whereas telco is a very limited set of users, the moment you get out into the broader set of cloud users and providers and developers, you need something a little bit more open. And that's where open container initiative comes into play. It has a different intention. It has an access that's available to anybody on GitHub. Um, the intellectual property terms are defined in that you have an Apache 2 license on contributions from the contributors, but you also have an Open Web Foundation 1.0 patent-only agreement that all the members agree to at the point that those releases are done. And the participation, again, wide open versus one that may be a little bit more closed for other reasons. So what we want to do is reach out again, do a study in the age of post-COVID worlds and say, you know, what do people think open standards means? What is open standards in terms of others' uh, perce perceptions? What do they value as part of the open standards ecosystem or process? Um, what do they uh, think about, you know, the different strategies around this? And what can we learn as an organization that helps bring up and pull together standards communities? What can we learn from this and ultimately take forward? So with that, I'll turn it over to Jory. Yeah, so um, we, we also really wanted to tackle this from a uh, practitioner's perspective. So um, together with some really awesome partners, and I want to thank um, all of them, uh, but also ECMA International in particular, um, because they've really helped field this survey to a wide variety of people who are um, participating in the development of standards and also consuming and implementing standards. So we will be releasing this report really soon. We'd ha hope to have it done in time for this, but we're very busy people, so anticipating this in the next couple weeks, I hope. Um, and um, we'll, we'll get this done. And we're keen to maybe evolve this as well into something that we see more annually, again, because we think that we can learn a lot from um, surveying practitioners on a regular basis. So uh, we will uh, also make the data available as soon as uh, the, the report goes live. Um, looking a little bit at the uh, demographics, which is obviously really uh, important. We had a total start of just over um, almost 1,100 uh, total um, people starting to take that survey, 496 valid respondents um, after we cleaned the data for um, qualified responses and that sort of uh, things based on that screening criteria. We ended up working with third pa panel um, 
provider to make sure, again, that we're just getting an unbiased uh, set of respondents to the survey um, and to ensure a lot of balance in, in terms of demographics, which you can kind of see here. I'm pretty proud of this, actually, from like the standpoint of it being our first survey. We, got, um, we, we, we were able to kind of balance that across uh, North America, APAC, um, Europe, uh, a, a pretty even balance across organization size, and then um, also by industry and, and whether these are folks producing technology um, as a core business or whether they're um, consumers. So we um, will have, again, more, more info on the breakdown of the demographics in the final report. But we want to share some of the select key findings today. Uh, and I say select because we'll say some of this for the, the report. Got to have something newsworthy, right? Um, involvement in, in standards, especially open standards, is really widespread. That's probably not, uh, may, may or may not be surprising to you. Um, we talk a lot about uh, within the LF uh, adoption of open source, but uh, I thought it was worth calling out that 91% of the organizations that we surveyed said that they are involved in open standards. Um, we'll kind of, this may be hard to see, and so I do apologize for that. 74% um, said that they were involved in, in non-public standards. Um, this demonstrates really that organizations recognize the benefits of standards participation. They recognize that there are benefits in, uh, you know, ensuring that their products and services are really compatible um, that, and policy compliant. Um, I think it also indicates that they're not just adopting an open source only technology strategy. They're 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 really leaning on both. So um, just a, a good uh, good result to see here. Another key takeaway uh, was that organizations widely prefer open standards and as the, uh, to the rate of seven times more than other, um, other standards. So uh, this was pretty cool to see um, across many of the, the segmentations that we did, organization type, region, um, size, uh, and role within the company, uh, vast, vast preference for um, open standards. The small organizations showed the most preference or the strongest preference for open standards compared to others, but as you can see, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty big gap uh, across, the, across the board. Uh, geographically, the regions um, also clearly showed a preference for open standards, North America um, more so, uh, but then also um, other regions as well. So again, it kind of reinforces that despite you know, political differences between these regions, um, they are, there's, there's a great preference for um, open standards. Question. Yes, Jeff. So we didn't have um, qualitative uh, like text fields, so we have to assess, you know, um, based on just like the responses. Um, in the survey report, we kind of go into like why that might have been. We did get a lot of responses um, from participants who said, you know, my organization largely does, uh, you know, earn revenues from patent royalties, and so we have some. Um, you know, guesses that we can make uh, based on that, those responses that there's, there's probably a contingency of, um, of respondents who are, who are participating in, in this field from a standpoint of like revenue generation. So, um, so we also wanted to know, you know, it, it, what's the value over time that you see, right? Um, and we, we saw that people were responding that open standards deliver stable or increasing value over the last three years. Um, we asked, you know, how has that value uh, increased over time? And 64% of organizations in our survey uh, reported that that, that that definitely increased it. Only 5% um, of organizations indicated that the value derived from the open standards decreased, and 32% indicated that it remained unch unchanged. So um, overwhelmingly, 95% of organizations state that they, the value derived from open standards either remains um, constant or it's increasing. So, um, you know, I think this is a strategy that 
orgs uh, generally are, are seeing increases in value over time and, and thus, um, and, uh, thus a, a, a strong bet. 72% um, of organizations say their customers prefer products and services based on open standards. Um, they are listening to what their customers want and reporting that open standards uh, are, are the way to go. Uh, RAND and RF standards both factored into IP strategies as reported by our, um, our survey respondents. Um, one thing that we really didn't get into with this survey was really testing like theories about uh, licensing strategy and so on. We just wanted to know um, what the uh, preferences were and, and what, the, what their experience was. So we, we kind of set that to the side. We don't test that theory. Um, but it was notable that 73% of organizations did agree uh, that the advantages of open standards um, explicitly outweighed uh, you know, any patent or royalty opportunities um, compared to 8% who, who disagreed with that statement. So um, really, uh, really interesting finding there. Open standards increase competitive and innovation. 80% of orgs uh, state that open standards promote competition uh, in the marketplace. Um, you know, many of you work at orgs that are concerned about timing the market, and that is a very hard thing to do. Open standards do provide a compelling strategy, um, kind of like compound interest rates, early competitive benefits that you find can kind of build and accelerate over time. And so it was a really cool finding to see that the, um, the orgs found competitiveness in the short term and the long term and innovation in the short term and the long term, uh, they, they, they felt open standards provided the benefits uh, that there. 80% of orgs uh, say that they, that increased, the increased use of open standards will make them more competitive. So again, kind of building on that um, pro-competitive pro nature of open uh, standards. Increasing involvement in open standards drives some strategical and tactical improvements for organizations. And we asked orgs then why they should increase their adoption of open standards. 76% uh, of organizations said that increased use of open standards would make them more innovative, so more, um, you know, uh, um, innovative over time. Um, and the number one reason was that uh, the, the open standards would improve productivity um, for that org. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, finding as well. So here's a little bit of a breakdown um, of why respondents felt their organization should increase the adoption of open standards within their org. So you see improving productivity, um, becoming more innovative, avoiding uh, vendor lock-in, which was, is, is another common reason why people um, choose open standards. Um, and, you know, that, that was uh, very, very much worth calling out. Um, on the security front, uh, open standards contribute uh, to hard and soft benefits, and one of those things is uh, security. 77% of organizations say increasing their use of open standards will improve um, cybersecurity. Certainly in today's environment, that's um, top of mind, um, and it's worth calling out uh, that, that they felt that from a security posture standpoint, that was, um, was a, a strong benefit. Um, so again, uh, improvement to uh, security, improving the overall quality of open standards that organizations use. It's not just about um, being part of a production process of, of, um, of, of a standard, but also consumption. When you're implementing it, you learn a lot about you know, um, how well it serves you, if there are gaps, if there are problems. Um, you then can contribute back, uh, and that is seen as a, as a big um, benefit to an open standard. Um, then there's other soft benefits as well that were noted, like uh, being a more attractive place to work, improving the firm's reputation, and so on. So 
So we did look at the segmentation, um, and I regret that I don't know those numbers for you, um, but we do have a breakdown in our report in the appendix where we, we uh, take a look at, like, was there a difference in org size and a difference or a difference in region or things like that. Um, where there was something that was really notable, we did try and, and call it out here, but um, for, for the most part, I was really surprised at how consistent the, these perceptions were across, um, across size and, and region. So great question. Um, all right. So 64% of organizations say that, um, that open standards delivered increasing value over the past three years. Um, I think that might actually be a duplicate, but uh, the point is over time, the value of open standards seems to increase for orgs. And I think you know we have some great examples of that, the internet, um, the World Wide Web Protocol being one, that's 30 years of royalty free um, this last week. So, uh, you know, Again, like compounding interest, these benefits can be um, uh, you know, just increased over time. Um, another finding we, we uh, gleaned from the report was that it's easier to participate in the development of open standards according to our survey respondents. We asked how easy is it to participate um, from personal experience. You know, you have had uh, groups I've worked with that have been very easy to, to participate in, some that are, that are uh, less so, um, but by and large, uh, open standards got the nod uh, to, to non-open uh, standards. Bottom line summary um, from the report, um, investment in standardization as an activity, as an as a organizational tech strategy, uh, remains really strong and really complementary to open source. Um, we found that firms were, in fact, continuing to participate, continuing to invest in standards, um, and that's, that's very meaningful. Um, We've also found that open standards have eclipsed closed standards in driving innovation, value, and competition, and that's from, certainly from the real and perceived benefit standpoint um, across a, a, a lot of segmentation. And then also that open standards provide uh, transformative benefits and increasing, for val increasing value for organizations over time. So again, like your investment in an open uh, standards project today is going to reap, uh, reap return for you um, in, in time. So why does this matter? That's a great question. Why does it matter to, uh, uh, to, to do this research? Um, Royalty-free standards face uh, new and existing uh, threats. Um, challenges like unfamiliarity with uh, the importance of universal re reciprocity, uh, the new EU IPO SCP regulations. Um, we have key participants in the process which are juggling um, business models based on royalty generating, uh, sorry, Oh, sure. Uh, EU is European, IPO is uh, the, their patent office, SCP is standards essential patent. Yeah. Um, rife with acronyms, the app is standards world. Um, so uh, yeah, so key participants that are juggling, uh, you know, large uh, royalty generating patent portfolios, it's something to, to manage um, with and around. And then also shifting awareness about the value and benefits of open standards, especially with new generations of participants um, coming in. Just as uh, with open source, we have to kind of continuously, you know, build awareness for open source licenses and practices and development models and so on and so forth. And um, the open standards world needs this as well. So uh, very important. Um, probably most, like wh the why, the real why, is that if we're going to solve the world's like most pressing important problems, 
we need to be able to innovate safely uh, together. And here I'm talking about like climate change and you know sustainability and energy management and all of that sort of thing. That's not going to be solved by any one firm or any one really creative geni genius like Elon, right? It's going to be something that we have to um, work together to do. And so, um, how can we, you know? use what we learned through the survey. Um, well, I think this means uh, helping our projects and our organizations um, start to better draw on or fully adopt open processes and procedures in order to maximize the chances for success for that effort, right? We all want to see the work that we do together succeed. Um, acting on opportunities to bring in new contributors, bring in more uh, folks, collect feedback, act on that feedback um, to improvise and ease onboarding and implementation, make it easier for people to give that feedback and safe. Um, and then also thinking holistically, are there ways that we can support or bolster the work that we do together through other programs um, like you know, a conformance or, uh, or certification process or policy or things like that? Are there other programs that uh, we can um, Used to to achieve success for our, our standards projects. So um, that is a super rapid fire uh, review of the key takeaways from our report. We did want to uh, make sure to make space for questions, and so we will field those now. Yeah. That's a great question. So the question is, which took longer? We did ask for the perception um, which takes longer. Um, and that was so close. It, they, they were very, very much um, equal. I, my assumption was that people would report that open standards would be faster. But the finding was really not, um, there was no substantial difference. So. standard that may be open? Uh, I'll repeat the question. Does this involve um, just software standards, or are you looking at all kinds of standards, like hardware standards such as USB-C? So um, the framing was ICT standards, which does include software, but could and also include like hardware protocols as well. Um, technology standards uh, it was, was the, the scope of the survey. We didn't look at things like you know, building standards, for example. Yeah, I'll just add, we have standards projects that we host that are, you know, like, Risk five as an ISA, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's more or less a standard. There, there's there's a number of things that also border, you know, hardware, software. You know, it's just in the general technology space. So. Yes. You mentioned that one of the challenges on the, on the slide, I think it was the previous one, is that uh, conflict of interest back and forth. That some key participants are juggling business models based on. Well, as the lawyer would say, I am not your lawyer. <laughs> Certainly, we can't provide legal advice. But, um, you know, I, I think there's different approaches. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time at a very large company who was one of the largest patenters in the world for many decades. And, um, you know, what we did is we patented in certain areas of technology. And then there were certain areas that we decided we were going to work on in an open model. And at that point, we did not assert or create royalty, you know, license programs around those areas of IP. Um, so there's a way that you can go about this intentionally, 
And then, what, you know, there's also some companies that, you know, we see it's a little bit maybe not as coordinated or intentional where certain business units may be wanting to gravitate towards an open standard for various reasons of market opportunity and things like that. We see a lot of open standards are more or less if you build it, you know, it, all boats rise type of a model. Um, but, you know, there's a number of companies who have other parts of their business, which their day-to-day -day goals and metrics are based on how much revenue they uh, licensed out associated with their IP portfolios. And so those parts of the business may be, you know, conflicting in terms of their goals with other parts of the organization. And some, you know, companies have figured out a way to manage that process and be intentional about it, and some haven't. And I think that's where we see some of the, you know, the, the challenges because some companies are, you know, a little bit scattered or, you know, depends on who you talk to. What, res what answer you'll get in, in terms of what's going on. We see this a lot in some spaces where there has been historically a large uh, standard essential patent uh, licensing program established around certain standards. So when you start looking at mobile technologies and some of the core uh, mobile uh, standards, you're gonna see a lot of that. If you look at video codecs, you're gonna see a lot of that. Um, you know, and what we'll see is some companies will fight you know, the opportunity for open standards to even exist. Um, we've seen that recently in uh, some, you know, of the video codec space, for example. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's other ways of doing it, though. Instead of trying to, you know, squash it from ever happening, some companies are embracing it for certain parts of their uh, future technology roadmap or product roadmap, and then maybe reserving some aspects for their proprietary, you know, technologies. And so there's a lot of different approaches out there. I don't know which one, you know, each company will choose, and I don't generally give them guidance other than, you know, they have to figure out what they want. And my, my general guidelines are be intentional about what you're doing. The sort of scattershot haphazard, we'll see what happens and let our business units fight it out, generally doesn't go well in the long run. Steven. Okay. Um, was there an attempt to do some kind of back analysis? Is it on? Oh, oh. sorry. Was there some in, uh, analysis done on the back side? Uh, when you say ICT standards, mm -hmm. I have to learn the hard way that telco standards are different from infrastructure standards, mm -hmm. are different from things like the IETF. And because of the way uh, investment flows in those very different industries, IP practices flow differently. So to mm -hmm. uh, your point that some people get very fussy about standards, but that's because the telco community, the mobile community, does things dramatically yeah. different as an industry, not just the assholes about standards or about <laughs> patents and, and it's so if, yeah. if there was any way to start to tease it apart afterwards that would be really interesting data to see I agree um, I think we learned a lot putting this first survey together um, and I think that would be a, a I think in the future we might add some better questions to help us better do that back analysis there's there's probably some that we could we could attempt but not enough that I would feel really confident in making any like key insights um, on that basis. So I, I think I think that would be a great improvement to to a next um, next survey. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I think there's some interesting dynamics, especially in some newer spaces or newer segments that you may not consider would be a haven for some of the you know past mobile type of activities. But you know if you look at like for example electric vehicle charging standards and some of the IEC standards, they've even baked in you know software requirements into the standard where you have to use a copyrighted files from the IEC itself into an EV charger. Um, the challenges associated with that, you know, to scale out, you know, a viable EV charging solution that actually is innovative in, in improving lives is is a challenge. And so you see some companies with proprietary standards or, you know, some, you know, others, you know, sort of leading the way on that front. Um, I, I noticed on the collaborating organizations, none were internationally recognized SDOs that I know of. It doesn't mean they aren't, but the ones that I'm aware of weren't on the list. So there's also a tension between internationally recognized SDOs like W3C, IETF, 
I'll put ISO in brackets because um, they're not really open in how you can participate. But um, like, is that tension addressed in this? Slash, could it be addressed in future work? Because some people who like doing work in those international SDOs are annoyed at certain other organizations spinning up groups that do standards that they think of could be happening in their space. <laughs> uh, that's a politically charged question, yeah. so maybe I'll take it. <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, testing our diplomacy. It's not lost on yeah. us that yeah. you know some of the you know newer efforts are you know challenging the status quo of some of the international organizations, and I think you know my message has been you know we would love to evolve with them and help them on this and. Some are a little bit easier than others, like ISO IEC JTC1, which is a collaboration between ISO and IEC, is a much different uh, you know, engagement model than if you go to, say, one that is not open to you know, more of what we do. Um, you know, JTC1, for example, we are, as a joint development foundation, we are a publicly available specification. Um, you know, entity, so we can submit you know any of our standards through a PAS process with them to get uh, approval. You can even you know then apply to have JTC one publish your publicly available specification and standard as a free one on ISO's website, which is actually an extra process, but um, can be done. And um, you know, so there are some ways to figure it out, but it's not obvious and it's very niche. So. If you wanted to say, for example, publish an open standard for electric vehicle charging, as I'll give you an example, you may face a lot more pushback and them saying, well, in order to do this, you must go through our you know, standards process, which is not as open as many people would like to see and uh, has a different outcome and a different result. And so I think there is a tension. I think it will play out. Um, you know, I'm. I've got a front row seat to an electric vehicle charging situation right now, so I'm using that example a few times. But um, you know, it, it is something where there's you know a traditional standards model that sees open source and open standards as an extension of open source, and that may not be you know what they necessarily think is uh, is a value. And I think there's an ulterior conversation that we have to get into at some point. And Jory and I have talked about this, but. You know, if you look at how a country measures innovation, mm -hmm. most countries, most economists measure innovation based on patents, number of registrations as a particular metric. And, um, you know, if we perpetuate that model indefinitely or we don't change that, then we're going to be stuck with measuring innovation based on patents. And as anybody in the open source world knows, that's not necessarily a great measure of innovation from our perspective, because we're doing a lot of innovating and um, we are not uh, counted as any innovation in that metric. So that's another aspect of it, where I've had you know, very high level conversations with some of those organizations you're thinking of who aren't on that list. And um, you know, they're very openly talking about it, you know, in, priva in private at least that this is a challenge that they face. I think I would add to a lot of those like traditional SDOs that you kind of mentioned um, are trying to figure out what their strategy is and should be with open source and what the relationship you know, what a successful relationship between, you know, um, source code implementations and spec specs could be, but um, it's just been maybe more of a, a challenge for for that mode of development than it has been, um, you know, for a group of companies to come together and do something quickly because they have business objectives. They have things they need to do. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And to give an example, the jury is like, uh, three weeks ago, I was in Geneva with a conversation with an international standards organization you would recognize. And leadership matters too. They've got new leadership in place, and the new leadership sees that there's a different model and that there's a different way of doing things and they want to learn. And so we can't also just assume that, you know, because they were resistant to it in the past that they will be in the future. Sometimes it's about timing. It's about having the right people in the right place with the ability to do something about it. So we play the long game. 
We're open. We're pretty transparent about what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, we do play the long game. When you're ready, let us know. <laughs> Let's talk. I think we may be at time. Yeah, three forty was our in time. We started a little late. I guess uh, I guess that's it. But um, Dylan and I, I are around. It's actually three fifty. Three fifty. Is it? Oh, what I had three forty. Are we three? Does anybody? Is it three forty? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We're over yeah. time. Yeah. Sorry. So thank you. <laughs> Come find us. Um, and uh, thanks for for coming. Thank you.